Taylor, then I started listening to more and more folk music and got particularly interested in Harry and Sam because I do live in Norfolk now. So I'm, I'm sitting now no more than sort of 40, 45 minutes drive from where Harry spent most of his life and where Sam spent most of his life. They lived about 12, 15 miles apart. So I got interested in these two men, but I, I found it quite difficult to find a lot of detail about them. In Harry's case, the sleeve notes to Bonnie Laboring Boy, which Steve contributed to, and Chris Hepper, Reg Hall and others, Paul Marsh. In Sam's case, the sleeve notes to Cruising Around Yarmouth, which were mostly written by Chris Holderness. And of course, there's the singer and the song, the, the film the BBC did in 1962, Charles Parker um, took charge of, in which they both appear alternately. So I thought, if I'm interested in this, and I can find a lot of interesting and new material, will somebody publish a book about it? And thankfully, Equinox Publications, um, based up in Sheffield, agreed it was a decent idea. So that's how the book came about. Once I started researching, it became obvious that there was a lot of new material out there that hadn't really been picked up or hadn't been given the opportunity to be expanded upon. So I found new sources of information. I was put in touch with Harry's granddaughter, Jenny, who was very helpful, and Sam's great-great-niece, Jane, who was also extremely helpful. I met and spoke with people who knew them, Peggy Seeger, Martin Carthy, uh, Bob Pegg, Frankie, uh, and many others. I think in, I did about 40, 45 interviews for the book, plus a lot of, of archive research. In the first instance, I had questions answered. In the second instance, I had new questions arise. And what I was particularly interested in is not so much the songs and their genesis, but Harry and Sam as, as people, as members of their communities, as members of their families. So I write a lot about Harry and Sam's family life. There are parallels and there are distinct opposites and contrasts in their lives. Harry was an agricultural labourer based around the Broadland area of Catfield, Potter Hyam. Sam was a, most of his life on the fishing boats, trawlers and then drifters, and spent most of his life living in Winston, which is on the Norfolk coast, as I said, about 12, 14 miles away from where Harry lived. I found a lot of information about Harry and his wife Elsie and their children, and also about Sam and Dorcas, his wife, and their adopted son, William. In both cases, there's, there's quite major tragedies involved there. And if people wish to, to ask me questions, I'm happy about that, but I wanted to keep things a little bit lighter. There were two stories that particularly fascinated me. One about Sam. Sam talks at length to anybody who would listen about his success in a singing competition in Lerwick in the Shetlands in 1907. He talks about how he won a prize, how he performed old Bob Ridleyo. And this is a story that comes up time and time again, but to be honest, I didn't really believe it. Folk singer winning a singing competition in the Shetland Islands in front of hundreds of people seemed a little bit odd to me. And Sam, I was told very early on, tended to embroider, embellish or invent episodes in his life. So I dug around a bit in the Shetland Times and lo and behold, Sam Lana won a singing competition in Lerwick in the Rechabite Hall in front of hundreds of people. Not only once, but at least twice. Not in 1907, but in 1908. And what interested me even more is that before his first appearance in the 1908 concert season, the Shetland Times announced the news that Sam Lana, the well-known comedian and dancer, was promised to appear. So that was an element of Sam's life that says a lot about the performances you can see and hear of his when he was in his 70s and 80s on record. Another issue that I was very intrigued by was this strange group of fans that Harry Cox had as a singer. Harry had a little coterie of fans amongst some of the UK's leading contemporary and avant-garde artists of their day. Augustus John is probably the one who's best known now, the painter and sculptor, who claimed that Harry was one of his favourite singers. 
Philip Hesseltine, the composer who changed his name to Peter Warlock, who became a fan of the magician Alistair Crowley, described by the Daily Mail as the wickedest man in Britain, who enjoyed naked motorcycle riding, was also a major fan of Harry Cox. And one particular episode for me which draws in both those men is the first evidence I found of one of Harry's songs, learned from Harry, being performed in Winterton, Sam Lana's home village. And this occurred in about 1926, when Hesseltine, John Goss the singer, Augustus John, and Hesseltine's girlfriend, Barbara Peach, broke into Winterton Parish Church one stormy Saturday evening. Hesseltine took to the organ and performed a version of Harry's Bold Fisherman, which he called Down by the Riverside. Augustus John wrote that this beautiful but profane song was performed to great effect on the organ. Things started to go awry, John wrote, when, moved by a perverse whim, I proposed to revive the rites of a more ancient cult by there and then offering Miss Peach upon the altar. My ill-timed pleasantry had hardly been uttered when, with a deafening crash, a thunderbolt struck the building, instantly filling the interior of the church with smoke and dust. So Harry Cox not only has a song performed in Winterton Church, he also brings about its demise thanks to a little bit of black magic rites from Augustus John. I didn't believe that story either until the church warden explained it was absolutely true. The biggest mystery of all though, and what I'll close with here, is why when Sam and Harry lived almost parallel lifespans, Sam lived till 1965, Harry to 1971, when they were both filmed by the BBC in 1962, Sam in his cottage, Harry in Sam's house. Why did they never get brought together to at least talk to each other, if not perform? Harry's daughter Myrtle blames Sam. Exactly why it never happened, I don't know. Maybe there's a book in that on its own. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there and hopefully I've left a minute or two for a question. Yeah, th thank you, Bruce. Uh, yes, a, a round of applause. Um, show your hands, everybody. Oh, that's it. That's good. Well done. Thank you. Um, we do. We do have time for questions, don't we, Martin? Yes? Nod your head. <laughs> <laughs> Martin's muted himself. Uh, okay. You, have time, you have time for questions, but you won't have time for the second presentation because you talked a lot. Oh, because I talked a lot. Should... What are we going to do, everybody? Shall we have questions now? I'd like oh, some no. questions. You, you, you won't have time for the second presentation anyway. We've already had 31 minutes. Okay. I've just had a message flash up to say we now have unlimited minutes. Really? Yeah. Yes, I just got that. <laughs> All right, let's just carry on until they throw us out. Like, sort oh, of... Right, go for it. Closing time. For it. Um, see, now, you... You can apparently raise your hand. How do people do that? Tell me again, John. How do they make? How do they do they, a hand? They can raise their hand. Oh God! Right, it's in the um, bottom of participants. Yeah, the bottom of the participants window. There are three dots, and you can raise your hand there, and that right. should take you to the top of the list. So there's someone called Ken Fackrell wants to ask a question. Okay, Ken, wherever you are, because I can only see some of you on the screen because there's too many to. You know, you've, you've spilt behind the laptop. Ken, are you there? Hello, yes. Uh, no, I thought I'd clicked raised hand in appreciation rather than speak. Oh. <laughs> but this is technology getting the better of me. But uh, well, I enjoyed that enormously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Thanks, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Has, any, has anybody else cracked out to raise a hand? Or, or you can wave and one of us might see you. Yeah, right, Pippa. Pippa and Will. Yes, Pippa and Will Noble, is it? Pippa and Will N, is all I've got. Can you unmute him, somebody? I w we've unmuted ourselves, can you hear us? Ah, right, right yes we can, yes, hello. Yes, hi, hi, I was, um, uh, reactions, hand clapping and thumb, um, thumbs up are in reactions on the bottom um, of, of the screen. 
if people want to do hand clapping, virtual hand clapping. Right. Um, and Thank our you. question is, I, I, I missed the title of the biography. Could we have that again, please? Yeah, it's called Two Bold Singer Men and the English Folk Revival, to give it its full title. It'll be out in October um, from Equinox Publications. Excellent. Sounds fascinating. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've got um, I've got me um, I've got it written down. Yes. You, you, if you go to Equinox's the Equinox Publications website, you can read a kind of chapter by chapter uh, synopsis of the book. Right. There are a couple of inaccuracies in it. Oh no. Oh no. Yes, because I was foolish enough to believe that the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography was accurate. Oh. <laughs> Turns out it's not, at least in terms of Sam. It has Sam's, Sam's date of marriage is 20 oh, years oh, out. But apart from that, I'm sure it's, <laughs> it's, it's perfect after that. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Thank you. That's great. Brilliant. Look okay, forward thanks. to it. Anyone else asking a question? No, it's all gone. If anybody does want to ask, you do need to raise your hand in the participants window because there are so many people we can't see everybody. So yeah. I think it was Heather quite rightly said you can clap in, you can show a clap or a hand in, in your little uh, fingernail picture, but we won't see that because we can only see a right. third of the people here. We can only see some people, can't we? Okay, shall we move on as we're running out of time? Everybody seems rather reticent. Thank you, Bruce. I'm re I really am looking forward to the book. Thank you, Steve. Um, and uh, th thanks for thanks for writing it. What what comes next? What's the next book? You're not going to um, go back to jazz again, are you? Um, no, I'm, I'm currently thinking about a biography of Sir Henry Hubbard, who was the fourth baronet of Blickling and the last man of, in Norfolk to be killed in a duel. Oh, did he sing traditional songs? There are a couple of songs relating to a couple of things he was involved in. Oh, well, that, that's close enough for us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Let's move on to Gwilym, who's going to give us uh, mouth music, I hope. Um, everybody, I think, knows Gwilym. He's got a book coming out. Um, I've forgotten the title. What was the title? It's called Catch It, Bottle It and Paint It Green. Catch It, Bottle It and Paint It Green. Mm. About your experiences as a collector, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah. in Southern England and in America. Excellent. So we will look forward to that. So over to you, Gwilym. Okay, I'm going to share screen for a start. Oh, Lord. Oh, no, you've disabled, you've disabled my screen sharing. You've got to, you've got, got to enable my screen sharing. Who had, um, that's Martin yeah, again. Which I presume is you. Oh, well, that's all right. I've got screen sharing now. I uh, haven't, I haven't got your screen. You will have. Yep. Okay. Gwilym has started screen sharing. Right. Uh, there you go. We got ah, it. Right. Right. And there's a couple of little things I've got to do under advanced. Let's have a look. I've got to share computer sound as well. Um, okay. Can you can you see that? And start from the beginning. Yes. Right. right magic. Okay. There is a way of turning off the um, what do you call it? The thumbnails as well. The gallery. But, uh, anyway. Here we go then. This is the first slide. I've got to do a little bit of mouse stuff here um, because, where is it? Hang on. Uh, this might cut off before the end, in that case. Step it away, me footy boy. Step it away, me time. Step it away, me footy boy. Your legs keep time. Step it away, me footy boy. Step it away, your time. Told you about your pleasure when your shoes keep stuck. Do 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 down. Do do down to 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 do down. Do 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 do
I don't know why it cuts off, but uh, anyway. Um, that was the gypsy Joe Dozer Smith recorded in his trailer Layby near Beaconsfield in 1976. And the music is he is diddling or tuning, as the gypsies tend to call it, is for step dancing. And it's a mixture of nonsense syllables and snatches of ditties. But we'll come back to Dozer in a minute and unpick that a little bit more. Now, um, step dancing is defined, if you like, as making a rhythmic sound with hard shoes on, on a hard floor in time with music. And it runs throughout the folk cultures of the British Isles and over the Atlantic <coughs> to the USA and Canada and elsewhere. And of these traditions, the one that gets least attention is that of England and Wales. Now, it would have been a familiar sight not many years ago in English village pubs and kitchens or around the campfire um, for this diddling to step dancing to go on. The tradition was carried on in particular by gypsy families who carried the dancing to a high degree of skill. And anyone who's seen Tommy Orchard in Devon or Percy West in East Anglia can't fail to be impressed by their dancing. The music provided for step dancing would usually have been by fiddle, mouth organ, organ, mouth organ or melodeon, or in many instances, by mouth music, which is the topic of this presentation. And mouth music in England and the Welsh tradition is different in style and context to that, say, in Scotland or Ireland. In these countries, it's been elevated to a high degree of skill with diddling or lilting competitions and diddling appearing on the concert stage as a performance in its own right. Compare this with England, where the diddling has a pure, purely functional purpose, nearly always as an accompaniment to step dancing. The only time uh, it being performed without a dancer would be to please the collector sitting in front of the performer with a microphone. It must be admitted at this stage that the information on the subject is very sparse. The first detailed description of gypsy diddling for step dancing we have is actually from 1909 for step dancing in the New Forest amongst the New Forest gypsies. And this was noted by Alice Gillington in about 1909. And it looks like this. You may have read the book, uh, Songs of the Open Road. And she gives a description of the dance. Two girls hold a stick horizontally, one at each end. One of them, holding on to her end of the stick, begins a heel and toe step with an occasional backflip of the right foot, the while she encircles around, singing the words and humming the bars in between. Well, that to me sounds like some form of step dancing. And there's a rare field recording. Aye, 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 for the fish and taters. Aye, 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 for the fish and cod. La dee do doodle do dee do dee. La dee do do dee do day. La dee do doodle do dee do dee. Do dee do doodle do day day. La dee do doodle do dee do dee. La dee do dee do day. But there's nothing more on the subject, really, until Peter Kennedy's recording of the Connor family in Cambridgeshire in 1956 which you can hear on the British Library website. And then from the 60s onwards, we have a trickle of recordings of diddling, usually by gypsies, and usually discovered when the collector is searching songs, not researching the step dance tradition as such. However, absence of proof is not proof of absence. And we can assume that diddling to step dancing was going on all this time out of earshot, out of earshot of the dance collectors. And uh, the diddling used for step dancing, especially by gypsies, was nearly always brisk hornpipes. And it was uh, not nearly the nonsense syllables like diddly diddly, but would be mixed in with ditties, snatches of folk songs, humorous ditties, nonsense, or even slightly bawdy, bawdy rhymes, or sometimes anglo romany ditties, such as Mandy went to pull the Gry. And very often these ditties would be a prelude to the actual diddling. And here's a typical example. This is just Jasper Smith from Surrey. Oh, wait a minute. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, Jasper Smith from Surrey, and he's singing a nonsense ditty to the tune of Brighton Camp before he embarks on diddling. And it sounds a bit like this. 
Oh, I slept all night in the tinker's arms. The tinker put his arms around me. Oh, there was folks and there was jokes. And Paddy's lost his banjo. I wouldn't part from my sweetheart for tapping St. Nephard in another load of wagon men. Get a bit of bread for the women. Your tunes used for diddling are, are very often the well known ones, such as Brighton Camp, there, um, the Manchester Hornpipe, or occasionally a Scottish tune called The Drunken Piper. Now, The Drunken Piper was recorded by uh, what's that, Jimmy Shand, and often the diddling would include an exhortation to the dancer to step it away. And there are lots of examples of these recorded in recent years. This phrase comes frequently in the dance, in the diddling ditties. Let's go back to Dozer Smith again. Listen again, and you will hear um, you will hear that rhyme, the step it away rhyme, and then he and then he diddles a version of the drunken piper. Uh, drunken piper is, is interesting because it's in a minor mode, and it's not something that would be traditionally played on a a mouth organ or a, a, a melodeon, I suggest. And yet it turns out, I've, I've found it several times in the repertoire of diddling gypsies. So have a listen again to Step It Away and The Drunken Piper. Step it away, me footy ball. Step it away, me time. Step it away, me footy ball. Your legs keep time. Step it away, me footy ball. Step it away, your time. Don't you bite your flesh when your shoes keep stuck. And again, it cuts off. Can't do it. Sorry about that, but uh, something technical going on there. It's often assumed that diddling was used when there was no instrument available, but this notion is refuted by some of the evidence. When Peter Kennedy recorded the Gypsy family uh, of Connor step dancing in 1956, they performed various dances to the music of a mouth organ, but after a while decided to step to diddling. So it was an alternative choice for that family. Uh, step dancers, non-Gypsy step dancers in Suffolk pubs in the 50s, I'm told, um, often preferred dancing to diddling rather than an instrument, according to um, Neil Lanham whose uh, memory goes back quite a few years in that area. The Brazil Gypsy family from Gloucestershire often tuned for their dancing, even though they played mouth organ and melodeon. So it, it was an artistic choice to use the diddling. Um, nor was diddling for dancing confined to solo step dancing. Again, in Suffolk, according to Neil Lanham, uh, dancers would dance a 400 reel to mouth music including snatches of a song, Southwold, Southwold Fair. Whilst in Wales, uh, and we have to bring in Wales here, the magnificent Phil Tanner um, from the Gower Peninsula, he would diddle for a whole evening's dancing, including the four-handed reel. Um, these days, there are hubs of interest in step dancing, particularly in East Anglia. Um, we've got John and Katie here, which is nice, and Devon, and pockets of interest in Hampshire, Sussex and Somerset. But to my knowledge, none of them have embraced diddling as a musical alternative. Now, I, I've got to say this is part of a longer study that I'm submitting as an article to uh, the Folk Song Journal. But I'll end my short presentation now with Phil Tanner. Uh, he's diddling to a group of dancers dancing a four-handed reel. And I'm sure that some sort of step dancing is is involved here. So here's Phil Tanner, and this is this will end my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Switch off the share now, then. Great. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gwellem. Everybody is clapping. I can see them all <laughs> waving, <laughs> clapping, and, and thumbs upping. Thank you very much. It was really good. Um, I don't see anybody's hands in the list of question uh, in the list of participants. Maybe nobody's learned how to do it. <laughs> but the chat is saying interesting. That was wonderful. Yeah, I can see the chat. The tune you have as Brighton Camp is known in the US as Liberty. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brighton Camp over here is a very common tune, isn't it? I mean, it... yeah, no, I didn't know that. That's interesting. My friend Deborah Chessman. Hello, Deborah. Mm -hmm. But it's nobody officially showing. As John, a... John Halson is waving his hand, but hasn't found the, the thing to click. OK, well, can we unmute Good him night. anyway? <coughs> Hello. Hello, John. Hello, Katie. Uh, just first off, probably the forehand reel was not really a country dance. It was actually a step dance. I mean, it was stepping and then moving across. Is that right, Katie? Yes, yeah, so it didn't really. I don't think it had figures as as we'd recognise in a social dance, yeah. as such. I think it was just stepping on the spot and then changing places. It would be similar to the Dorset forehand reel, then, presumably. Um, yeah, I think so. I think it's more often done in the square. There's, uh, I know Simon Harm on here will know quite a bit about it as well. But and there were five hand reels as well, weren't there? So, you know, Romsborough Heath, as well. Romsborough Heath mm -hmm. was a three handed reel mm -hmm. just done yeah. in a line, double line, yeah. Meeting, stepping, and yeah. uh, figure of eight, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that, that's right. how we envisaged it, certainly, not, not as a dance with figures. <laughs> right. the, other, the other thing I wanted to flag up. Um, was about um, diddling, singing songs for actual social dancers. Um, I presume some of you will know of this, but I don't know whether Gwillem's found it yet, but there's a book uh, by Keith Norman MacDonald, uh, which is Scottish songs, Scottish Gaelic songs, which were used predominantly for actually dancing to. Uh, and this is an amazing book. It's just been republished. There it is, if you can see it. Um, it was republished in February, uh, but the original book was written in 1901. But also, there's a fascinating CD uh, of Scottish songs for dancing to, or were used for dancing to, which is in the uh, Scottish tradition series. Uh, have a look at both of them. They're both on the uh, on the Green Tracks uh, website. Um, mm. I just think it's a whole other. It's something that we've not really looked at in this country, in England, uh, and I don't know whether anybody's got much evidence at all, apart from what Willem's just told us. I wonder if Steve knows of any particular songs that were used for social dancing. Not that I can. Not that I can think of. Sorry, Willem. Back to John a second. Mm. Um, I, I was just going to say, I, I deliberately didn't concentrate on the, the Scottish or Irish side because there's a vast amount of information on that already, and I really don't have the expertise in that. Just that's why I concentrated on the English. But that would be useful for reference, um, just to uh, put it in more context. Have a look at this. Have a look at that. Yeah. Can I say yeah. Margaret Bennett was trying to get in there? I think. Pardon? Margaret Bennett was trying to get in. Margaret, are you there? Uh, Margaret has also put something on the chat about it. I did. Yes. Thank you so much for this. I was I found this 
quite inspiring. I don't think I'm surprised that, that you find um, Scottish tunes among the English gypsies because the Scottish travellers did a lot of travelling. They would go down for the hop picking. Even, even Sheila Stewart and her family went to the hop picking. That yeah. generally, and of course, Sheila and Belle um, diddled. But the drunken piper, um, I've seen that done to dances. My, we, we've done it at home. I'm from Sky. And it's Fire me be in the sound of his mohawkers, fire me be in the sound of his mohawkers, fire me be in, and so on. But the, the diddling, I, I, there was mostly words in the Scottish ones, and they were usually about um, teasing and domestic incidents, as you know, so and so's got a boyfriend, and we saw them, and you know, tell everybody, etc. Or um, ones with very clever um, onomatopoeic lines about, or it could be anything, about the dog ate the puddings, it could be anything. But there was lots and lots of them. And, and I've seen whole kitchens, but my, my childhood was in the 50s, so we didn't have electricity. And uh, there wasn't always a piper or a fiddler around, but we would just sing. So it was, it's wonderful to see that you've done this. Um, um, that's, and it really does, to me, make a lot of sense that people, you know, who had very, uh, you know, the same sort of, ideas would would do just that these are fabulous examples thank you so much i think julie wants to ask a question julie's put a hand up Can somebody unmute julie uh, hi hello julie the best way hi yeah what is the best way that i can learn this please because i do i dance and i'd like you know club so i'd like to know how to to do it, do the diddling. Where you live? If you live anywhere near near East Anglia, talk to the Housens. If you live anywhere near Devon, there are lots of people I can put you in touch with there. I, I live in Nottingham, so well, then it's in online, you know, <laughs> any online recordings. Yeah. Online recording. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a step dancer. I can't step dance. I just do the music. That's okay. I'll, I'll... Thank you. Uh, you can get recordings from veteran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Give us the email address for veteran. Yeah. Uh, well, if you go to the website, veteran.co.uk. Right. There are lots of examples uh, dotted all over the place. Topic records, veterans, certainly. Um, and uh, musical traditions in Strode. Um, the, um, a, a lot of them have included a little bit of uh, diddling there. And uh, I mean, th this is doing just what I wanted it to. It's de teasing out more information. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Shall, shall, we, shall we move on to David Sutcliffe? Is, is David there? I can't see. Hopefully you can hear me. Ah, Steve. there you are, in the middle there. Hello, David. Hi, Steve. Dave, David's going to talk to us about Cecil Sharp's singers and his Fine, um, yeah. efforts to find them. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Hope everyone can hear me. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Dave Sutcliffe, um, and I live in retirement with my wife, Leslie, in near Taunton in rural Somerset. Um, I've been a Morris dancer for... 25 years and learnt eight traditions there and I took up step dancing last year so I'm trying to understand dance well and I occasionally sing. I don't know how many people um, remember the Folkopedia um, website that was trying to look at some singers. I, I, I think it's defunct now is it? Anyway, don't know. Um, uh, after I, 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 several years ago, I wrote a book about Charles Marson, the vicar of Hambridge, um, and I had to do a lot of background work on Somerset singers. Um, and since that book, um, I've put more material into the Somerset Heritage Centre and did some work for Pretty Folk Festival last year. Uh, and I've been working for two years for this new website, Cecil Sharp's People. Dot org dot uk. It's up and running now. Um, I'm wondering whether Martin can hear me. Oh, excellent, Martin. Thank you so much. Look at um, that. There are, uh, on the performer directory, if you could just go to that, Martin. Yeah, click on that. So there we are. There's 700 <laughs> uh, 
profiles of singers, musicians and dancers who met Sharp between 1903 and 1924. If we could just click on perhaps O, and then we'll see Mrs. Overd there, Emma Overd. Yeah, so the way the website works is I've done fresh research on her life. Um, and if you go back to the, scroll back to the top, um, if you click on the VWML, that would take you to her songs. And then if you click back, if you click on Langport, then you can see her fellow singers uh, in the area. Uh, there's a little marker where she used to live and other singers that um, she um, sang with um, and knew well. So it's an area directory and there's a performer directory. And uh, the important, th thank you, Martin. The important thing to say that the work is really ongoing uh, I reckon I've got about eight profiles to go, including Maud Carpley's at some point. <laughs> um, so it's about two years work putting this together. And if anybody's got updates, we were talking about the Oxford National Biography having some errata in it. The same thing applies to my website. I welcome additions and comments. Please use the contact box to get to me. Um, it's a not-for-profit website. I funded it myself. Um, and um, I would say there are two overriding aims of the website. Um, the first was to be exactly sure of the identity of all these performers. No mucking. I wanted to know their family history and get it right. And the second uh, thing is I wanted to align the singers with the digital archive, as we've just seen, at the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library. Basically, we knew the songs, but we didn't know the singers. So with the EFDS support, um, I've managed to put this website together. Now, it's, it takes about a minimum of two hours uh, to research these singers on per performer on the Ancestry website. I've been doing amateur genealogical research since the 1970s. So I do know some of the pitfalls involved and try to check myself carefully as I go along. Some of the performers had simple and settled lives. Some of them had very complicated lives and moved around, perhaps picking up songs as they went. Uh, as regards other sources, I was building on the work of Bob and Jackie Patton, uh, Chris Behrman, and Yvette Stalens uh, here in Somerset. I had access to Bob Patton's Somerset files, um, but his work only went up to the 1891 census. So there's a lot of new information since then, but um, Jackie Patton was very supportive and I could see Bob's files. I could not see Chris Behrman's files. They were locked in a computer. So I did all my fresh research really. Um, I did consult the David Bland folders up at uh, uh, VWML. He had tra traced a number of the descendants of singers, so I was able to see those folders. Uh, initially, I, was, I got a little grant to do the Somerset singers, but basically I thought, what the hell, let's do everybody. <laughs> so um, I've I moved Devon, Cornwall, Gloucestershire, and right round all of Sharp's performers. I should be mortified if I've missed anybody. Uh, so I was able, obviously, to see the work of Keith Chandler. The Glostrad team have a great website. So I was trying to check against what they'd done. And I tried to acknowledge all sources. Apologies if I've left anybody out. I didn't do a great bibliography because it didn't seem terribly sensible or practical. Um, as regards Sharp's data, uh, the collectors of the first revival vary greatly in what information they gave us about singers. They sometimes failed to record the basics, name, location, and date. But Sharp was consistently good at all three of those fields, and he began adding the ages of his singers 
in the summer of 1905, and that has really helped to confirm identities. Occasionally he misheard a surname, but in general he listened carefully and his record as an oral historian before such a discipline was even devised is pretty good. He left us, of course, a mass of field notes. Now, handling all this data was really tricky. I needed to set up spreadsheets for Somerset singers and non-Somerset material and a separate spreadsheet for all the Morris dance material. How Sharp coped with all of this, I don't know. Even with a computer, I, get, I got muddled. Just a few practical problems to explain. Uh, the state registration of births, marriages and deaths only began in 1837. After that date, you can discover a person's name in the quarter of the year when they were born. But if you want more information, you have to pay for a certificate, 11 pounds odd, and I had no budget for that. So I tended to rely on baptisms, weddings and funerals in parish registers, um, but not all counties have shared their parish records. Uh, the census records, you've got eight censuses from 1841 to 1911, and next year we shall have 1921, which may help with a few issues. Um, to go back to the website, it's an alphabetical, people-based directory of performers, and I've put them in their geographical context, the area directory. It was too difficult to organise a themed approach for dance, so if you want to find a particular dance tradition, Leddington, Ilmington, Longborough and so on, type that into the search box and you should be able to find the right informant. Singers are in green, dancers are in blue. That's the colour coding. So to, uh, <clears throat> to press on, the main takeaways I would say are two. My website hopefully will address the age old question of who were the folk. We can be at last more precise as to the ages and occupations of the men and women who passed their songs and dances to us. Uh, I haven't yet collated these statistics because I've been so busy doing the profiling work. Um, the other takeaway I think is a clearer identity for women performers. Confirmation of the maiden names of women singers allows us to spot relatives, singers and cousins, and thus pick out intra-family transmission of songs. We can see perhaps how Sharp bounced around communities, meeting new singers recommended to him by other family members. So you have Louis Hooper and Lucy White, half-sisters, Lizzie Welsh and Mary Jane Ree, our sisters. For example, John England and Sarah Ree were cousins, and so on. So I've learned a lot myself from this research, but of course you can't get a sense of the personality of some of the singers. The story that Bruce Lindsay told earlier on gives you some of the personality of a singer. But anyway, I hope that um, putting together these, this profiling website will help people have a much clearer idea of what life was like before the welfare state um, and how tough people's lives could be. So um, above all, I think it's helped me to see song and dance collecting as a human endeavor. Sharp was learning as he went along, making some sense of what he saw and heard. There's been a lot of post-match commentary on Sharp. I just wanted to see him on the pitch, so to speak. So, uh, as regards the future of the website, I'm going to curate it for three years and then review it. It seems to have come along at the right time. The Country Dance and Song Society in America has just sponsored a centenary exhibition of photographs of Appalachian singers. And you can find that on www.cecilsharpinappalachia.org. I'm glad I didn't even contemplate researching those singers. So I hope you enjoy the website and find it useful. Use the contact page to get in touch with me. Thanks. Great. Everybody clap their hands. <laughs> visually. That was excellent, David. Thank you. And thank you for doing it. I'm all in favor of databases, of course. Um, and it, it really is a 
an incredible Thank resource. Um, had one question. Have you used newspapers? For, yes, sir. I certainly have. I've subscribed to the British Newspapers Archive and um, have found some good, useful material in there. Um, it's scattered through the website. I welcome any additions anybody might like to give me. Excellent. And, and the other thing is that um, we desperately need a biography of Cecil Sharp. <laughs> so I think all those who, who think that David should do one when he's finished the website should indicate with a thumbs up now. Um, because we really do need more. There's an awful lot of misinformation about Cecil, and I think um, we need somebody to really, you know, I tell us been, about him. I have been thinking about it. It is a mammoth task. Oh, I know, but that's why I'm <laughs> saying in front of all these people, in case you say, oh, yeah, I'll do it, and then you're committed. <laughs> I, I can't see anybody asking questions in the official way. Is there anybody trying to get in? Martin's yes. waving. Could I just say, David, um, I don't know whether I've said to you before, but I do have quite a lot of Chris Bowman's materials. Um, it's worth checking to see whether I've got anything that helps. Fine. Thanks for that offer. I'll, I'll get in touch with you, Martin. Thank you. Is, is Chris's material still locked away? Yes, I think Yvette Stalens had it and I talked with her about it and she they, it could not be unlocked because it's a property of Bournemouth University. So it would need special permissions or something. I, I didn't have access to it anyway. Right. Can we organise a burglary? <laughs> yes. that, Watergate of Bournemouth. Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else asking a question? No, not, not that I can see. Oh, Gwillem's waving. Oh, Gwillem's waving and so's Vic. All right, Gwilym first. Gwilym, not unmuted. There we are. Can you hear yeah. me? All oh, right. First of all, uh, David, I think it's a fantastic job you're doing. Um, I think we have a lot of things interesting in common. Um, I'm glad to see that the Glossclad website was useful to you because um, I did an awful lot of work on the family history of all Cecil Sharp's um, singers and musicians, which is published on that website. Uh, one of the things I found when I started doing the work, um, to get at the parish registers, I had to go either to the church or to the local record office to get the information. But Gloucestershire Archives have now put all their records online. So it's made it hugely more easily easy to get at the uh, census data and the, the BMD data. So um, that's, that is quite good. The other thing I found was that if you just put somebody's name on the internet and send it out there, it's amazing what comes back. Things like newspaper articles, obituaries and things. You know, I was just amazed what you actually get uh, just with simple query. But um, we really felt on, in Glostrad that we also wanted to uh, put something out there about the actual singers rather than just the songs. Um, so, uh, and certainly as far as women singers go, um, my book, which many of you have seen, Really Beautiful Company, goes into a lot of these, back, the background of Sharp and other singers. So we have the, all the information about Gloucestershire on there already. And if we can be any more help to you, David, um, please, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank That's you, Karen. Excellent. Um, I'll just say that I, I, I acknowledged the Glostrad website and found it really helpful and I checked, tried to check everything I was doing, but I did do fresh searches sure, for, yeah. all, for all the singers, which you, I think you should do. So please check out Gl uh, Gloucestershire and see, see what you think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. Vic, and it better be the yeah. last question. Yes? Yeah. No, it's no, not a, just a couple of comments. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful piece of work and, and I'm so pleased, David, has done it um the uh the it's not i mean it would be interesting enough in itself but the functionality of the tie-up with the vaughan williams records is fabulous uh and just makes the whole thing flow so much easier and i would really commend it to people and, and you know 
absolutely thankful that such a good piece of work has been done. I just want to add one thing uh, while we're on the subject of Cecil Sharp, and it ties up with Gwilym's. I mean, he was very dismissive of step dancing. He, he knew about it. Um, this, I haven't looked at this stuff for a long time. Maybe people have looked at it since I did it about 20 years ago. But uh, he was just not interested in it. I mean, like he lost interest in English country social dance. Um, he just thought it was commonplace and he couldn't see a use for it. And so he didn't really bother with it at all. Uh, the tunes were commonplace. The, it was something, it was semi-improvised, so he couldn't get a hand on it very easily. And uh, I, 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 again, I think your work on the step dance uh, is fabulous because it is a totally neglected area. I've finished. Okay. I'll, just, I'll just come in on that a little bit in the sense that when he first came across it, Sharp, I think it would have been um, in the Mendips, he actually found it very exciting. Um, I think he, you're right, though, he couldn't get a handle on it. I think he personally found it quite exciting. I wouldn't want to be too, too hard on him like that. If you, in the website, if um, um, Parfit, the dancer, is there and, uh, and Henry Cave was fiddling at the time, he really enjoyed it. <laughs> Steve, right. Nora had her hand up. Oh, Nora had hand up. Right, Nora. Um, well, I was just wondering, um, because it seems, I mean, it seems like an incredible website and an incredible project, but also it seems very broad. Um, so I was curious as to wherever you, would you start with a project like this? I mean, how do you, you know, sort of manage to, to start on something of this scale? Oh, just to say, I began really in Hambridge and, and with researching Reverend Marson. Uh, I was particularly interested in the gloving that, were, that went on in the village. A very high pr proportion of women were using um, singing in, with their gloving. I think I just, it grew like topsy, as they say. I, I just then expanded it and, and Mrs. Overd was interesting in Langport. And, and I just, it, I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, David. Move on to our last. Steve, you've, you've muted Steve, yourself. Steve, you're muted. Steve, you have mu muted yourself. I haven't touched it. <laughs> right. I, I did not touch the machine. <laughs> anyway, you all know Martin. He's our secretary. He's also got a book, an award-winning book, as I wrote out, a book about Sabian Bering Gord. Uh, but today he's talking about a habit of singing songs my father sang. Hello. Hello. Good. Well, my father... Raymond Gardner was always an early riser. He would sometimes forget that he wasn't alone in the house and start to sing at six in the morning. But he continued to sing throughout the day when he was alone. And the songs were mostly those he'd learned as a boy from the family's small collection of 78 RPM records. Most of the songs are incompletely remembered and rendered, but somehow that didn't matter. The habit of singing was irrepressible, a subconscious need. One of his favourites was, uh, oh, is that? That's it. One of his favourites was Leslie Cerrone's Don't Do That to the Poor Puss Cat. And my stepmother told me that he was still singing it in his 80s. Well, Martin, Martin, that's coming over very muffled to me. It's over recorded. T turn the volume down a fraction, I think, if you can. Right. Anyone else having the same problem? Yes, people are nodding. Okay. And I got the tune, but I couldn't hear the words. Oh, dear. 
Okay. Uh, Never mind. Need a few yep. bars. No, 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 no. Yes, better, better. Okay. My great grandfather, who came from Germany, worked as a medical assistant at Eastbourne in Sussex until he ran away in 1898, leaving his wife and eight children in the workhouse. My father and mother met in Eastbourne as teenagers. When we drove down to see relatives on the coast, there would usually be a point on the journey when my father would sing good old Sussex by the sea. Though his work had taken him out of his native county by less than a mile, we never doubted that in his heart he was an exile in Surrey. Um, he worked with aeroplanes and another song that made another made a regular appearance was I'm an airman. I got a nice house down in Kent to live there free, don't pay no rent. The reason is quite plain, you see, when the landlord calls on me, I'm an airman, I'm an airman, and I fly, 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 fly up in the sky, ever so high. Sparrows, they can't catch me because I fly so high. I'm an airman, I'm an airman, and I fly, 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 fly. Now, I only ever heard my father sing that one verse in the chorus, but in later years, he told me that there was another verse which he didn't sing because my mother didn't like it. It took me a long time to track the complete song down, but I eventually got a copy of the sheet music. Um, but it was only last month that I found Rickaby's recording, and here he is singing that unsuitable verse. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wish I was at the bar. Flat up, I fell in love with a girl named Sis. She told me she was a single miss. When her husband came on view, I said as he said, who are you? I'm an airman. Two other songs, the old sow and the farmer's boy, came from the comic singer Albert Richardson, who lived in Burrish. Uh, that's Burwash for those born outside Sussex, so not too far from Eastbourne. And here I have stronger grounds for believing that these came from recordings owned by the family. Both of these made occasional appearances over the years, and he was very good at the sound effects in the old sound. There was an old farm where he had an old sow, oats, oats, idly down, Susanna's a funny old man, oats, oats, idly down, Susanna's a funny old man, sing last of all ring to the law, Susanna's a funny old man, oats, oats, idly down, Susanna's a funny old man. The Farmer's Boy was the song that I remember him singing most often, and this would be the one that drifted upstairs in the early morning. And I remember it being sung at Christmas parties with the family. Most of the graders were competent singers and my uncle Ron and aunt Alice, like my grandfather, performed as soloists in concerts around Sussex and Kent. The rich sound of my uncle's baritone would roll around the room, dominating the chorus. To plow and sow, to reap and mow, and be a farmer's boy, and be a farmer's boy. Among my father's papers, I found an envelope containing some handwritten and typed song texts. They're a mixed bunch, and I can only guess that my parents sang them at social gatherings. And one of the items is this file card with a penciled text of a song about the French Foreign Legion 
which may have been a result of the fashionable interest in the legion that followed P.C. Wren's 1924 book, Beau Geste, and which spawned a number of films and books. It's an intriguing little piece and I'd love to know more about it. Stop sharing for a minute. Um, family gatherings often involve singing. After my mother died, our Christmases were spent with Uncle Ron and Aunt Alice in Eastbourne. On the evening of Boxing Day, someone would drive over to collect Cousin Sid from his farm. And he always brought his battered old melodeon with him. This is the item in question. You can see the uh, cricket belt that's been used as a, a strap to replace the old one. Fine old uh, Paolo Sopra Soprani instrument, um, but not in great condition. Um, and the evening sing around would invariably start with the familiar combination of the choruses of Daisy Daisy and She Was a Dear Little Dicky Bird. And another of Sid's songs was Buttercup Joe, also popularised by Albert Richardson. But my father described some sessions uh, that had gone with, on without my knowledge. Um, my, while my mother was alive, most of our Christmases were spent in Eastbourne with her parents, Alf and Eliza Wood. And on Christmas Eve, the extended family would gather round the massive table that my grandfather, who was a builder, had constructed during the war as an indoor bomb shelter. After the washing up was done and the children had been put to bed upstairs to await the arrival of Father Christmas, someone would go out for a jug of beer and then the singing would start. My father remembered one particular song, or rather most of it. My grandmother Eliza had been born on Eridge, and this was a large and well-known family in Eastbourne, many of whom had connections to the sea. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Eastbourne lifeboat, James Stevens VI, was propelled by oars and launched with the help of the horses from the brewery. The lifeboat crew at one time contained seven erridges. And this connection is why a song that Alf Wood sang to the tune of God Bless the Prince of Wales had a special resonance in the family. On the fourteenth of and on the fourteenth of December in eighteen ninety four, a great big ship went and got herself wrecked down by the Hollywell shore. And then there was a verse which my father couldn't remember about the crew being called out and then. They came down in their trousers, their shirts and nothing more. Got in that boat and put to sea and brought them safe to shore. For seven poor souls were landed and all they got was wet. If it hadn't been for the lifeboat crew, what a watery grave they'd have made. I've not been able to find a record or a rescue by the Eastbourne lifeboat that matches the description, nor have I found the song anywhere else despite asking a number of Sussex researchers and singers, but I wish I could have been down, allowed downstairs to hear it sung. Now this is a simple story of singing in my own family, and I know that such recollections are not unusual, but I believe it's important that they're documented. One of the projects that Steve Rowd and I have been talking about is making sure we have proper records of singers for that personal repertoires, manuscripts and songbooks, in the same way that work has been done on tune books. And now's the time to make sure 
that these are properly identified and recorded so that the people in the future have good evidence of what was actually being sung by the ordinary people. And uh, thanks for that, for your songs and for the pleasure they gave. That's it. That's it. That's it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was fascinating. <laughs> None of those songs have round numbers. <laughs> no. oh, well, yeah. A couple of them do. But they will by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. I was going to say, what are the round numbers, please? <laughs> You'll have to wait on those, especially the Pussycat one. I'm not sure I've read that before. Um, I. I certainly underline what Martin said about um, uh, singers' manuscripts and, and songbooks. But talking about family parties, there, there's a book called Cockney Ding Dong by Charles Keeping. And that's about London, his London family and the songs they sang uh, in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And the, the knees up that they had every, uh, every Saturday night in Lambeth, South London. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, because it's, it's wonderful miscellaneous collection of music hall and pop songs and traditional songs and ditties. It's called Cockney Ding Dong, which is of course rhyme, rhyming slang for sing song. Um, now, has any, somebody has their hand up? Keith, Keith has his hand up. Can some, there's Keith down there. Hi, have you got me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, hello, it's Keith Gregson up here in Sunderland, uh, locked down here. Uh, absolutely fabulous, Martin. It reminded me of my dad. Um, he used to sing uh, Susanna with all the, uh, the, the, uh, the whistling. He also did Wheezy Anna, was another one he did. But uh, interestingly, uh, Roy, Roy Palmer uh, got my dad to record a couple of things for his soldier's song book. And one of them was, uh, Why Did I Ever Become a Corporal? And the other one um, had a rude word in it, and my dad was leery, and I got very surprised. It was called My Little Something House in the Sun, but, uh, the one he did in the desert. So uh, I was brought up very much like Martin with, with music all around me. And when my dad had a heart attack and he was taken to hospital, the last thing he did was, was sing uh, D-Day Dodgers on his way out. So uh, it means a great deal to me. So Keith, Keith, have you written this down for posterity? Oh, yes. Good. Yes, I've got, all, all, I've got all my dad's sheet music, all his 78 records, everything, yes. Oh, wonderful. Excellent. Can I just say how nice it is to see so many people I know out there through voice dancing and through uh, folk music in the past. Lovely. Thank you. Yes. And Steve, nobody else has indicated there by the yeah. official way. If yeah, I put, me, I put my thumb up there. I don't know whether that... You read <laughs> that. that means you like us. Uh, well, I do, I do. I think you're wonderful. Um, Thank you, Colin. Cockney Ding Dong, I've just been having an exchange of emails with Julia, uh, a s song she found called I'm an Abbey as a children's song. Yes. And that's in Cockney Ding Dong. That's and, right. Um, that, which is where I first found it. And uh, it's claimed to be Western and not Western and Lee. Who was it, Julia? Can you remember? He usually wrote with, with Lee. I Western and Park. Western and Park. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he claimed to have written it. Julia's picked it. Well, I'll let Julia say her side of the story. Anyway, I, I, it seems that, that, that it's probably Park rather than Western had picked this thing up from the tradition and uh, claimed copyright on it and turned it into, into a musical song. Anyway, I'll let, uh, I'll let Julia talk about where she, she found her bit of it. Hey there. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's just a tiny ditty that I found, actually. I'm looking at looking at um, children as performers, as, as singers. And of course, most of the evidence is really in singing games, if you look back over the collections. And funnily enough, Sharp collected from a group of children, although I've been looking to see if they're in the performers website, but I can't see how I'd get children. I was going to email you separately about that. But um, he collected that, I think about 19, oh, I don't remember, but the early 1900s anyway. And they sang this little song, I'm a Navi, and then they did a little game to it. So I was trying to find out a bit more about that. So um, 
it's um, there's a sheet music in the British Library which I can't get hold of at the moment, and it was Weston and Barnes um, were the, the names. Barnes, that. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, but weirdly, the sheet music comes from 1913, according to the British Library catalogue, and I think it was about 1904 that Sharp actually collected this song. So I'm quite interested in any other versions. But as you said, Colin, it's also in this uh, Cockney Ding Dong book. Um, so it was clearly, and it's got a real musical kind of feel to it. So whether there was an earlier song or, you know, I'm not sure. I'd like to know more about it if anyone <laughs> has got any details. I've got some more bits on, on uh, children's songs that I'll let you have, Julia, but uh, that are not appropriate this this to the topic today. Anybody else got their hand up? Oh, yes, David Sutcliffe. Yep. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, now, just to get uh, back on the children's um, co uh, collect, uh, collecting by Sharp, um, obviously they were generally anonymous, so I, they don't, I couldn't find a way of putting them on the website in a way. But if you look at Alice Snow and um, uh, Julie Porter, I think it is, um, there are two, those were two contributors that he named. And I've then listed the groups that he, he uh, collected from in Somerset. So it's a way into the website. I think it's um, Porter and Snow would at least find out, um, make some progress on that. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. And, and that's a more general problem, really, in trying to locate material by children. Um, I've looked up boy, girl, child, children um, in the Vaughan Williams index. You know, they were very often not named except as children. But it's, it's throwing up a bit of stuff. And if anyone's got any other you know, examples, I'm really interested in, you know, just this. It's just a new approach and a new topic that I'm writing about for the um, Routledge book that some of you know about that um, Steve and others are, are organising on folk performance. And it's just a really interesting, I'd never really thought about it from a child angle point of view, children as performers, except when I've been looking at children's folklore, but looking at, at it within the folk song context, I suddenly thought, well, how do you find them? So it's been quite instructive just trying to search them, how we name them, as you say. Yes, yeah, school children is another uh, word that us indexers use. Uh, Gwilym and Carol, have you, are you doing thumbs ups? Can we unmute Gwilym and Carol? Yeah, yep. yeah just briefly, um, we had the same issue with children um, collected by Sharp and others for our Crossfad website. Uh, we sort of got around this by putting children as, as a search term. Um, so if you go into that, all Sharp stuff collected from children in Gloucestershire is on there, but you have to look up under children. And we also have a tag for children's songs as well. So once you've got the material and you've indexed it, obviously it's a lot easier to find it. But I agree, the sources are difficult, mm. yeah. And we, we also had uh, the pleasure a few years ago of <coughs> doing a project with the children of Temple Guiting School, mm. uh, teaching some of the singing games that Sharp collected in that very school. Yes. So that was quite fun. Of course, the children didn't know any of them, but yes. uh, <laughs> enjoyed it. They get them from YouTube nowadays, I think. <laughs> yeah. But one of the things that Steve and I have discussed is actually, ironically, it's when the children are named, because we can't search by age, um, we, you know, you, you've, we haven't thought to index stuff as men, women, or child, man, woman, child, as the, the contributor. So it's really hard if the child is named, and with no way of knowing that is a child, unless they, that's brackets child in the index. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Sue Any Allen's more? got her hand up, Steve. Sorry? Yeah, I've got my blue yeah. hand up. In the oh, the blue hand, right. Um, uh, I just wanted to say, Peter Kennedy uh, recorded, has some of his folk tracks recordings, which are at the British Library, aren't they? Uh, recorded by Father Damien Webb at schools in Workington, in Cumbria and Keswick. Uh, quite a lot of children's material there. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I was sort of trying to look at the, uh, the singing games, but I'm also interested in trying to find any solo children's performances. 
Um, there may be some within family um, traditions that I don't know about, so I'd be really interested to, to find out more. Well, are we, what do you think, Martin? Are we done? I'd have said, unless you want to uh, do anything else, Steve? Well, I'll say a few words in appreciation. Um, mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen and others, uh, thank you for your patience today and for your presence. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it more than I thought I would. <laughs> um, so it, it's been really good and I hope you've all enjoyed it. We've learnt a lot. Um, can I suggest that for next session, um, Nora's going to give a paper and then the ask the panel, I think if people type a question into the chat, um, how about that? Is that a good idea rather than um, trying all trying to, to butt in? Um, but I mean, people have been chatting merrily. I'm pleased to see. Um, but I think we'll have to have some um, discipline so that if you've got a question that you want to ask, you actually start your chat bit with question so that we can tell which ones are questions and which ones are chit chat. My next question is, can people get to the chat after the Zoom meeting is finished or is that now just gone? Because there's information in there that people have been putting up about websites and dates and things is Andy, that permanent Andy, can, uh, about when the meeting finishes i will save it yeah wait, okay it can be and, saved uh, there's three dots at the bottom of the zoom group for a chat and if you right, go right, to that so I got you it. Can save yeah, yeah. You, you got it right and if you yeah but you've yeah. saved it martin how do other people see it well, I think we might have disabled that option. We would have done on the other system. It may be possible on this. Go for it if you can. But, uh, oh, it, it might be worth it. Oh, you know, because people have been saying, what's the website for so-and-so? And other people have been answering. Um, and nobody's taking the minutes. So uh, I just did copy and paste the whole lot. It seems to have worked. Ah, OK. I just pressed. Save chat and it says chat saved. I don't know where. <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in the world, our chat is uh, floating around. Okay. Can I ask Steve th this question and answer session next time? Yes. Is this, um, uh, are just general questions, or are you specifically talking about questions? You're not talking about questions for Nora's um, presentation. No. No, there there will be time for questions for Nora, as you you know, as an ordinary paper, and then the second part of the meeting will be this panel roundtable. Right. Okay. Um, so, would it be an idea to have questions in advance? Yes. Because I can I can. You know, if there's lot, if there are questions, or you know, it might might be just an idea to have them in advance so that you can read them out. A bit like the Hancock's half hour at five o'clock every week in the uh, with the government um, press conferences. Right. <laughs> yeah, but we'll we probably have a ask question, question from Martin of Gloucester, of Gloucester or wherever it is you live, um, <clears throat> and then the panel have got to say that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Yes. It. Are we allowed to say that's a really stupid question? <laughs> can I can I please say that at least just just once, just once? I'd like to say. It. Um, I, Martin, the people can email us on the TSF. Dot Zoom, can't they? Yeah. With questions, yeah. TSF. Dot Zoom. Dot Gmail. Dot com. Okay, so you also have to send me any feedback you have. Um, but do make allowances that it was a little more difficult today than we anticipated. I think you've done very well, you and you and John John Baxter up there. Thank God you were here. We certainly wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Well, I wouldn't. Um, okay, so again, if you're asking a question on the Zoom thing, please make it clear that it's a question 
Otherwise, we'll be reading out your comments, and that might be embarrassing. Anybody else want to say anything? No. I could I can hear some mumbling, but I can't hear any any real. All right then. Have Thank you, you very much, everybody. One more thing. One more thing. Oh, have one more thing. Have you told us what Nora is going to be talking about? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I did. She's talking Sorry. about oh, Helen Hartner's Flanders. You'll be getting an email with with the proper details, but she's talking about the Flanders collection and Flanders, Helen Hartness Flanders as a collector in Vermont. Is that right, Nora? Nora is nodding. So, yes, I told you that at the beginning. Pay attention. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Everybody else happy? How do we sign off these things? Do we just wave? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, and see you in a fortnight. Good luck. There you go. Bye. You're going to stay on for a minute, Martin. Can do. This is weird. Everybody's gradually disappearing. It's 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 quite scary. Yeah. Thank you, John, especially John Baxter for your assistance there. Well, I'm sure mine would have coped if I wasn't here, but. Uh... I well, I I was not coping. Um, I can't I can't talk and watch the screen and the other screen, and think about what buttons to press at the same time and I don't think any of us can no, do that no, so it really no. does help to have somebody just doing the um, technical stuff. I know there was a lot of, uh, I, I, I looked it up, I googled it and there was press comment and so on today on on website about uh, the outage on Zoom but, um, but Fifesing seemed to be able to cope um, you know, with the, they had a Zoom festival this week. Ma Margaret is shaking her head. Can somebody unmute Margaret? Margaret Bennett down there. She's trying to say something. Oh. But yeah, they were they were okay on the first lot, but today for the ballad session, they 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 ended up just putting it out live streaming on Facebook, because, oh, right. and they had communication from the Zoom. I don't know quite know how this amazing world works. But the suggestion was that with all the church services and church meetings, there were hundreds of churchgoers who were taking the front seats. And, uh, and, and our, you know, unless we get in with an early church service, we, we wouldn't have the same. So that was a suggestion. So I don't know if we can have it in an evening. Oh, no, they have church services then too. Or yeah. a Saturday, I have no idea. I always knew religion was bad for you. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. You're allowed to sing with them. You can tell both. <laughs> Anyhow, thank the Lord for this one. I really, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. It was good to see you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Perhaps having it on a Sunday is a, is a problem with all the religious services? No, they said that the, that the Zoom... Now, this is the wrong terminology for 21st century. The Zoom lines were all occupied. <laughs> Engaged. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the highway was too busy for us. No well, we, room. We chose, we chose so, Sunday because we thought that, you know, some poor people are still having to go to work during the yeah. week. And yeah. we've had it at this time of day so that we could get yes. America and so on. So I, I don't so we know. Put our dinner <laughs> and cook our dinner and press the buttons and do all that. I know. It was perfect, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. But it was right. good. It was good fun. Yeah. Thanks for it. I, I learned a lot. And uh, yeah. Yes. I shall. I shall. I shall leave you to it now. But uh, if you if you, if you need any help with anything or you know, well, I, I hope you'll be, you do. Hope you'll be there in a fortnight. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> it's real trouble.
Well, I may have lots of lots of questions, but my music hall project is raising more questions than it is. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Speak soon. Right. I need the low. I need the low now, so I'm going as well. <laughs> uh, <Tonight>. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.